All right. I'm with the man, the legend, Jock Newell Taylor. Jock was one of my first teachers and a long time, long time mentor of mine. He's really shaped my career and helped uh, help me navigate a lot of intricacies within exercise. And he is a, um, I would say, an expert on the nervous system, the brain, how it works and how these things tie into exercise. And more importantly for this group, how pain might arise and how our mental state, our mind might influence our experience of pain and many other facets within exercise. How are you doing, Jack? I'm doing really well, really well. That was a, a very kind uh, introduction, Eric. I think, um, you know, you've, you've always been uh, like a colleague who has pushed me, you know, always asked some really uh, questions that made me stop and go, huh what about that? So <laughs> I really appreciate it. The, the growth has been mutual. Yeah, man, that's been a, like a, a blessing in my life, but also a curse in some ways. <laughs> mm. Mm. Oh, tell me about it. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, you always receive uh, those types of curiosity and questions well, and you don't shun it. So that's awesome. Um, you know, most people don't know about you, so maybe we could start with just like telling a little bit about yourself, how you got into the fitness industry industry, and, you know, how you arrived at your professionalism today. Sure. Um, well, I've always had um, a real interest in uh, the nervous system, and for a long time, I thought I wanted to go into the medical sciences, but, um, or be a research scientist, Um but, you know, on the research sciences part, like when I was a teenager, I started working in labs and um, eventually I just, I didn't, I couldn't stomach what, you know, what you have to do, you know, with the animals as you're, you know, working with them. Um, and I thought it was cool that we, you know, you would discover all these cool things, but then the knowledge just seemed to sit on a shelf someplace, right? So I had a problem with that. And then I didn't really, um, uh, I don't know. My passion wasn't um, the medical sciences because there was a, um, a level of uh, protocols that you just had to do, right? There was no, you couldn't stop and think about things, right? It was, no, this is what we do. Just do it, right? Because if you don't do this way, you're going to have problems. Um, so then I stumbled into exercise in a way. Um, this was about, yeah, about 30 years ago, a little over 30 years ago. Um, and I realized that from my experience of exercise, I always felt better. And the people who I was around who were exercising, we all seemed to feel better um, physically, emotionally, in terms of our ability to focus and concentrate. And I really didn't fully appreciate that at the time, but I, that really drew me in. So my first entry into um, exercise was, you know, yeah, when I was in college, you know, um, and being a personal trainer and that just kind of stuck with me and I enjoyed working with people. Um, and I wanted to have a better understanding of how exercise works. And that was the quest from the time I started was how, how, how is that dumbbell doing something to you on the inside? And um, I just started questing and asking those questions over and over again of how does this stuff work and how can we make it work better for people? Yeah. And down the rabbit hole you went. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. So what is it about like guiding people within their exercise that you, you love so much that makes you passionate about it? Mm, um, it is, um, in a way, it's just my uh, my curiosity um, and um, and belief that, um, and I don't use that term loosely, but like my yeah, my core belief that um, if done correctly, exercise can change your life. Because whenever you are training your body, you are inevitably and inextricably training your mind. You can't separate the two, right? So. If you're moving your body, you have this opportunity to train your mind, whether you know it or not. Mm -hmm. And um, it's that it's that opportunity to help people move from I just want to lose some weight to wait a minute. In losing this weight, I'd like to feel um, like I make better decisions. I'd like to feel like I'm a little less fearful. 
I'd like to feel, I'd like to feel a little more empowered, whatever the case may be, but helping them to see this relationship between what happens with them physically and what also happens in their mind. Opens up a door for so many more opportunities that might be left behind when you don't think about that. That's right. That's right. Or also, um, you know, you'll have people who come in and uh, I'm sure you can identify with this. And some of our colleagues listening can identify with this. They come in, they have a goal of, they say, I want to boost my self-esteem. I'm sick of feeling overweight and, and weak. And when they're talking to you, they're constantly saying stuff like, I'm so weak. I'm pathetic. I mean, look at you. You're so strong. You have such a nice physique. I mean, God, okay, let's come on. Let's do this. Yeah. Just kick my butt. Let's just do another set. Right. So here we are, we are training, we are literally training that neural circuitry as they are exercising. So instead of as their bodies are changing, they start to feel better about themselves. They move further into a pattern of neuroses and feeling like they just aren't worthy and because they're not looking like you, because they will never look like you because they are mm-hmm. not you, right? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a tricky thing. And it's funny too, because you can see people changing in a positive way getting mm-hmm. towards their goals and still feel that way because that's they're right. driving that. That makes perfect sense. I think a lot of us can relate to that. Uh, so kind of in light of what you're talking about, if this, this term is thrown around mind, body, mind, muscle connection, I, I guess, what does that mean to you? Um, to me, it is the doorway to a far more um, hmm, serious um, conversation right? This idea that this connection is, is, is inseverable, right? People will even, they'll, they'll talk about this thing, you know, where you go to the gym and you just turn on the TV and you just do your thing, right? And you think that somehow you are, your distraction from the physical work is beneficial, where depending on what your goals are, you might be doing something that's very counterproductive. Yeah. Um, uh, there are other people that depending on where they are in their exercise, where you might want to strategically help them to distract themselves from the physical experience, right? But those are two different scenarios. So, um, yeah, I, I think it's about the specificity of working with each client about what they want from the specific exercise experience. So when would you think, can you create an example of when someone might want to be distracted when they're exercising versus when they should be really dialed in? <clears throat> yeah, I'm going to say the distraction is, is usually uh, something that is reserved for highly advanced individuals where um, they are being paid uh, to or they have committed for other reasons. Um, they are committed to going beyond what is healthy Mm. And into something that is um, um, certainly going to create some physical dysfunction. Mm-hmm. At that point, you have to figure out a way of giving, getting all those central governors to leave you alone and let you keep going. Right? Yeah. Like, uh, mm-hmm. like David Goggins, you know who he is? Uh, uh, ultra marathon dude? Yeah, yeah. The guy who's just just beats himself into the pavement. But I guess that would be kind of the circumstance you're alluding to someone who runs like 300 yeah. miles. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or if I have someone who says, Hey, look, you know, um, I am going to, uh, I really want to do some sort of special forces thing and I want to be in great physical shape. And you're like, okay, great, dude. That's awesome. The physical shape is one part of it. The other part of it is you are going to have to endure some things that are very uncomfortable. Now, I'm not going to be able to reproduce that stuff. That's not, that's not my goal, but I want, I want to within the confines of this gym and, you know, I can even take them out into the park. I want to see if you can continue to perform in spite of some of the feedback that you're getting from your body. Right. And then, so I guess in the context of my clients and the people mm. that might be listening to this, who might have some issues in their body that they're dealing with pains, aches, whatnot, and yes. this aging process, right? Yes. I would think the general pop and most people probably aren't in that um, spectrum. That we're discussing. Precisely, precisely, precisely. So for most folks, it is help them figure out what they need to pay attention to. Right. And if you can figure out what you need to pay attention to as you're exercising, 
then the television becomes um, hmm, not no longer useful, like mm-hmm. tuning out to the thing, right? Um, you actually start to understand that what you what you choose to place your mind on and how you observe your mind shift its position is going to be really helpful to you in terms of moving towards your goals. Yeah, you pick up on nuances and tendencies that could be influencing how you perform and yep. progress and whether yep. you stress out, get anxious or whatever. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, those are opportunities to get better. Right, right. So, so um, what comes to mind is uh, you take someone who, um, when they're working out, you notice that uh, they bail pretty early in a set. And we're not talking about really heavy loads, but they, they, they tend to stop the exercise before it really gets challenging. Mm-hmm. And you might even have some sort of external measure that lets you know, hey, wait a minute, you stop way before the physiological changes are happening in the tissues that we need in order to get to the goals that you want, right? But this person is having an experience. They're getting feedback from their body that is telling them, warning, shut it down. So what we need to do sometimes is help that person understand the feedback so they no longer are fearful of it, but they become curious about it, right? Um, uh, the first time people feel that, that, that intense tingling in your quadriceps when you're doing a knee extension, right? For some people, that is scary. They're like, whoa, something's happening that doesn't feel good, right? You and I, on the other hand, are like, oh, here's that thing. <laughs> we like it. We've learned to like it because we, we, we have an appreciation for what it is, for what it might be indicating. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So we might need to help that person understand that, that feedback. Let's be curious about it. It's not letting you know that the tissue is tearing. That is giving you information about the work that is being done in the tissue and some of the metabolic processes that are happening in there that we might need in order for you to get to your goals. And then people are like, oh, okay, well, okay, I'm feeling that thing. I'm feeling it. Yeah, I can, I can feel it. It's getting stronger. Yeah, that's kind of weird. I can do this. I can keep going. I can keep that same pace. And so now the sensation is no longer the thing that stops them. You might come up with another me- measure like um, when you can no longer keep the same pace, I want you to stop, right? So they got that Bernie sensation, but they're able to keep the same pace. They keep going through the Bernie sensation until they start to slow down or do the reflexive thing when they try to speed up, right? Mm-hmm. So th- th- there, there are ways to help people place their minds on features of the exercise that help them um, um, be more skillful and more curious about the sensations that they're getting from their body. Right. Don't resort to your norm necessarily kind of leave opportunities open for different interpretations of what's happening. it sounds like awareness and education is a big part of that for people. Yes. Yes. Awareness and education. You're absolutely right. Um, I think of, uh, of another scenario where someone comes to you and they say, Hey, look, I've been working out for a long time. I've had personal trainers before and we always get me to this spot and then nothing changes. Right. So you're working with them and you're going, okay, well, here we go. And you start to notice that they, yeah, they're not, they, they aren't working as hard as they need to. So then it becomes something where you can actually say to them, Hey, look, this plateau that you keep settling into might be because you are not giving your body the stimulation that it needs to progress. So let's talk about that. Right. Mm-hmm. So it becomes this, this thing where, yes, you're educating them um, and you're providing this opportunity to try on something different. Right. And if it doesn't work, you try something else. Does mm-hmm. that make sense? Yeah, totally. So other than maybe not having experience is kind of a lot of what you're saying. It sounds like maybe it's mm. something new for someone, or maybe they don't have a positive relationship with exercise or things of that nature. Why else do you think people stop um, before exercises get hard? Like, mental state, perception of the challenge, like what other influences might play a role in their ability to get into those intense sets? Um, historical context is, mm-hmm. is one big one. And what I mean by that is the last time my body felt like this, something bad happened, mm-hmm. right? And so um, there are, are, are processes, um, neural networks that will inhibit 
the amount of force that specific muscles can produce around specific joints, right? So if you have this horse historical context that says the last time we had that sensation in these tissues, something bad happened, your body is going to try to protect that and it will start to decrease the amount of force that you can produce so that you don't go any further. Mm -hmm. So if for some reason you believe that that specific exercise is critical to that person's progression, then you have to figure out a way of creating something that to them feels different. Mm. Right. For example, um, a very subtle thing, like on a leg press, um, instead of having someone start with their legs at uh, 90 degrees of knee flexion and their hips at 90 degrees of hip flexion, maybe you start it in a little bit more hip flexion and knee flexion, right? And you would say something like, okay, what I want you to do, instead of, instead of shoving on this plate, what I want you to do is I want you to pretend like your, your, um, your muscles are on a dimmer switch or like a volume knob. You're going to slowly increase the amount of pressure that you're using on this plate until you feel it move about half an inch. Okay. And then I want you to let, let it come back down. So they get to ramp up that force and to see, did I push as hard as I can? No, I just pushed like half my force and that thing moved that far. Huh? Mm -hmm. That wasn't so bad. So we've gotten around their guard because we created a new opportunity, a new experience for them. And now they have a new opportunity to see what they can do. Then we can pop them back into the old context and now that the nervous system has a new frame of reference, a new historical context, maybe something different will happen. Yeah, that makes total sense. And I've done that with people and it's always a shock. In some cases it's easy <laughs> and sometimes it's like, whoa, that's so hard. I feel it everywhere. Right. But yeah, so it's, it's always unique to the individual. And I have a personal mm -hmm. example, like uh, I, I stopped doing deadlifts for the longest time because it tweaked my back. And uh, mm -hmm. I started just introducing it again coming in it with a different perspective, trying not to be attached to the old experience, but just in the moment, in the present, let me just see how this thing feels and progress it. And it's been going really nicely, but That's awesome. yeah, I mean, we all, awesome. we all have these instances where we get hurt yeah. and we have some sort of trauma associated with that thing and breaking that neural network yep. that you're describing. Uh, maybe you can just briefly not getting too into the weeds, but what is a neural network for people who might that's, not know? That's a, that's a great question. Um, it is uh, a series of um, areas of the brain that work together to, um, to record, uh, to interpret, and then to come up with a behavior um, about an experience. Right? So you've got information that's coming from every single tissue in your body that's coming back up to the brain, basically reporting on the condition of your body. How's everything doing? Is anything under threat? Is anything about to be hurt or strained in some way? Where do we need to allocate more resources? And based on that information coming back up to your brain, you actually have a feeling about it, right? You might feel invigorated. You might feel defeated. You might feel afraid. You might feel anxious, but these things are real things based on what is happening in your physical body. And then based on that feeling and based on your perception of what you need to do, you come up with some sort of an action. You could push harder. You could quit, right? You could back off on your force. You could do something that is, um, I'll call it slightly chaotic, meaning do everything to avoid the intended experience. <laughs> Are you with me? All right. Yeah. So, so, so your, your, your feedback, the feedback from your body gives you some impetus to come up with a, a solution to the problem. Makes perfect sense. I mean, yeah. it's uh, it kind of lends to this next question and maybe we've kind of already covered that, but mm. there might be pieces that you will expand upon. And that is this uh, idea of like the nervous system and its role uh, within in our exercise experience and ultimately our results, what kind of role does that nervous system play within? Oh man, this is so deep. This is, I mean, um, well, well, um, it is the moderator, right? In other words, it's, it's detecting everything that's going on. It's the uh, instigator, right? It says, Hey, based on what, what's going on, this is what we need to do. Um, and it's also the sustainer. If you want to do this for a long period of time, 
here are the other things that we're going to need to do, right? It also starts to record these experiences. It says, hey, if this is, if this is what's going on, this is our experience of this. So if we have to do this again, this is how we're going to get the body set up and prepared. Yeah. It's, it's a really interesting thing. So think of this, this really simple um, example. When you go from a sitting position to standing up, the blood flow to your legs has to change really quickly, right? Blood pressure has to, and, and uh, has to change pretty quickly. I don't mean, um, uh, um, I don't mean in terms of diastolic and systolic, but as much as the allocation of the blood throughout your body it has to mm-hmm. change very quickly. If your body waited until you, after you were standing up to make those adjustments, you'd pass out every time, <laughs> every time, right? So before you even stand up, your nervous system is anticipating things and setting it up mm-hmm. in the very same way. When you pull into the parking lot of your gym, based on the experience that you've had the last time, your nervous system is starting to get set up. Either for, oh boy, here we go. Time to get my butt kicked again. Time for this to hurt again, right? And then now you start to have this uh, a, 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 a measurable stress response, right? We could, we could take your, draw your blood and we'd start to see an increase in some of the hormones that are associated with stress, yeah? So your nervous system is really back there trying to set up this physical plant to be successful at whatever it's about to do. Hmm. And every aspect of the experience is recorded and informs what you're going to do the next time you come in. Yeah. Um, your nervous system also sets up um, uh, protective mechanisms, right? It will, um, if tissues get too strained, it will set up this process called neurogenic inflammation. In other words, inflammation that is initiated by the nervous system, which can decrease the amount of force that you produce, change your range of motion, in addition to changing your heart rate, respiratory rate. Um, let's see, what else? Heart rate, blood rate, uh, and also, yeah, your, your stress hormones, right? So all those things your nervous system is right on top of. Um and so as you would say, it all comes down to the nervous system. Huh? <laughs> and that's my bias. I mean, I'll, I'll be honest with you, that, that's, that is def- absolutely my bias, right? Someone could argue that it's all about, um, I don't know, the, the vascular system or something like that, right? But I, I like to think of it that it all comes down to the nervous system because we can trace the contraction of a muscle from the brain to the spinal cord out to the muscle and then we can see the hormones that are produced by that muscle, contracting muscle, how they affect the brain, right? And the endocrine system and the digestive system. And so we have this big, massive feedback loop where the nervous system just isn't an, your brain, the spinal cord and the nerves. It becomes this massive system of, of organs, of glands, of tissues, of connective tissues um, that work together to allow you to do all the stuff you love to do. It is quite remarkable and when you really get into the weeds of the details it's really profound and crazy mm. how it all connects together um mm. without sounding too like uh like a can term but you know, everything's connected but it's so <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but right, it really right. is you know um, right so right. kind of on in line with what you were just talking about then how does someone's mindset going into a workout potentially affect their performance yes. maybe in the moment or long term Yes, yes. So um, this, this idea of a mindset, right, that athletes, I, I typically think of an athlete when I think of mindset, right? There's this zone I'm trying to get to, there's this pure focus I'm trying to get to, and, it's, and, and it feels like it's just one thing, right? I want to do this thing over and over again. I want to have a, I want to have a rigid set mind. When the more high, uh, highly successful athletes, entrepreneurs, um, artists that we talk to, it is not about a mindset. It is about the ability to appreciate where your mind currently is, and how you get it to slide over, right? And what you do with your mind where it currently is 
and when it shifts over. And if you notice when it shifts over, are you able to bring it back? And if you can't, what are you going to do with that? Right? It is, it is, and so instead of looking at it as a mindset, I like to think of it as a, as a mind flow, mm-hmm. right? Where you can come in the gym and be just feeling defeated, frustrated, tired, and sore, and leave the gym feeling inspired, flexible, and energized. But that doesn't come from a mindset. That comes from allowing your mind to flow, right? And getting all the barriers of your mind flowing out of the way and being able to appreciate how your mind flows. And then once you find yourself in a, in a spot that is, that is useful, notice how your mind wanders away and see if you can bring it back, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, it almost sounds like saying mindset is a disservice because if your mind is set, then you don't have the opportunity to come out of that. That's right? it. That's and it. It almost sounds exactly like meditation. <clears throat> Dude, that is it. That is it. And and, and I, I will not use that word with 95% of my clients mm-hmm. because, you know, that they're like, okay, dude, like I, I live in Maine. I don't live in California where you can talk about meditation, right? <clears throat> but that's what it is. That is exactly what it is. It is paying attention to where your mind is. If it's wandering over there, you're starting to think about, oh, did I, did I take, did I, no, bring it back to this, to this rep, bring it back to what you're trying to focus on. And you don't have to chastise yourself about it. Just so, oh, there I am thinking about something else. Come back to the set. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah, that's an important piece right there. Don't chastise because we all, especially meditation, people don't want to do it because they can't do it perfectly. It's like, that's not right. the point. Right. It's not to be perfect. That's right. But giving people the space and, well, I guess the um, permission to not be perfect, but just to try is important to hear. <laughs> that's it. That is it. And also to, to roll with that, um, that experience of, boy, today, I didn't feel like I had to try that much. And I was able to keep my mind more or less right here. Mm-hmm. And another day, it's going to be like squirrel, right, over and over again, right? And to, to allow that to be, that's not a sign of regression, right? It's a sign of being human, <laughs> right? <laughs> None of us are living in monasteries, you know? So I'm not. Right, so. Yeah. Right. <laughs> what? So, sorry. sorry. Go ahead. No, no, no. You go ahead. Yeah. Well, I guess um, you know, given my uh, demographic and then the vast majority of people that might listen to this are probably dealing with some sort of physical pain issue of mm. some kind. Uh, yes. So then, what role does the nervous system play in, in the experience of pain, whether it's actual material physical problems or just a chronic thing that's maybe sticking around when there isn't actually a damaged area. Yes. yes. <clears throat> so um, this is always a very um, tough thing to try to um, tease out. But as soon as you have an injury and you experience pain, your brain does a sh- interesting thing where it starts to rewire stuff, where it starts to anticipate things, just like, you know, the whole thing of standing up, right? Anticipating what it's going to have to do in terms of blood flow. It starts to say, wait a minute. I know that if shock goes past here is we're going to be in a, pro- we're going to have trouble. Mm-hmm. So as you start to come up here, you will start to feel pain because you have an issue in your shoulder. Now, once that tissue starts to heal, and if you haven't been exploring that range of motion, your nervous system is going to continue to set up that, that feedback. So you literally might be having pain in that exact same position, even though that tissue has healed. Mm-hmm. Okay. So my job isn't to make the assessment of, as to whether the tissue is healed or not. I leave that to somebody else. But once they say, no, dude, the tissue is it's a bomber. I don't, know what, I don't know what your problem is. That's when we can start to get creative about trying to give this person a new experience so that we get past the, 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 the wiring, the rewiring project that has happened in that shoulder, right? So it, it's, a, it's a two-step process there. It's first getting the, the information that the structure is indeed sound, 
then we have to say, okay, so how do we start to retrain this nervous system to explore that range of motion without prematurely anticipating this is going to hurt? Yeah, and that kind of lends to what you said earlier, which was uh, setting up novel stimuli, something they may not be used to, that kind of in a way tricks them into doing the thing and that hurts. That's it. That's it. I like to, I, 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 I hear what you're saying, Eric, but I like to think of it uh, less as a trick and more <laughs> of a uh, more uh, more of a because I, I know what you mean. But but w- some of our colleagues will take that and they'll not in the way that you mean it. Right. Mm. They'll take the word trick as in I know better than you. So I trick you. Right. Mm-hmm. As opposed to what we mean by it is, no, I just want to provide something that is different enough that you'll try it without recognizing that it's the same thing. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's a good delineation uh, because trick has a negative connotation to it for sure. <clears throat> or at least something that can get some folks in trouble. Right. Yeah. 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 Like magic tricks and fooling people. Not exactly what we're, <laughs> we're right. talking about, but right. I totally, right. totally hear what you're saying. Uh, so then is it fair to say that you're, if you had a pain and you know, the material stuff is healed, uh, is there going to be an influence with your, your mental states, your emotions in regards to experiencing that pain on a day-to-day yes. basis? 100%. Um, um, if I have a client that is, um, who, who has some sort of positional pain, um, I'm going to do a lot of uh, work with that person around getting them in a mind frame that is, um, I'll call it, relatively neutral where they simply feel curious and that won't be available every day. So what's interesting is you, you know how we all, all, we all train it. All, all we trainers have great interpersonal skills, boy, we've got the gift of gab, right? We can talk to people about their lives, but here's where it comes in handy. They walk in. Hey, how you doing? Doing pretty good. No, really? How you doing? Yeah, this is that not so great today. Well, is that is that sticking with you? Yeah, it's really bothering me because it's something I've been trying to work on for the last few weeks. So today might not be the day where we're going to throw them into that position where they have that pain because they already have some. Uh, um, um, they, they already may be skewed toward the end of of the spectrum of protection. Now, if as we continue to work, they're just saying, man, I feel so much better. Every time I come in here within five minutes of like just starting to do our work together, I feel so much better. Awesome opportunity, right? Now I might be able to say, okay, here's what I want you to do then. I want you to hold on to this thing and we're going to pull in this direction. Okay, now we're going to push down this way and I want you to let everything relax, right? So now we're kind of sneaking up on this range of motion that we're trying to get to. But yeah, the, 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 the mind flow or the inability for the mind to flow is critical in terms of um, when you decide to make these explorations. Every day is not the same. Mm. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a big thing. So, you know, we have all had days where, man, we just feel run down, stressed. It yep. might not be the day to go after some of those sensitive things for sure. That's right. That's right. You know, there's, there's this weird thing that happens with people I work with, and I'm sure a lot of people who have had material damage, uh, maybe they have arthritis, maybe they've had, like me, cervical fusion, I have other herniations in my neck, things that will never change. Uh, people in my position can be in chronic pain all the time. For me, I'm able to manage it. I don't really experience much at all. Uh, I guess what I'm trying to get after and maybe you could shed light on is if you do have material damage, things that are not really going to go away, but yet somehow I exercise and it keeps the pain at bay. That's interesting. So I wonder if you can elaborate on why that might be. That is really interesting. Um, So sometimes it's a perfect confluence of um, what your muscles can do. So when you exercise, your muscles can, can generate just enough tension to position the, the, the difference in your structure in such a way that you have no pain. That's one part of it. The other part of it is your brain um, is malleable. It's malleable. And there are certain aspects of pain that can um, be eroded minimalized. 
just by your just by your confidence. I like that word better than the other one I was going to use. I was going to use the word that starts with a B and ends in E, has an L in the middle, believe. Oh. <laughs> but, but your confidence, and I'll, I'll tell you why I say this, by your confidence that this thing can help you, okay? I will tell you this, 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 this interesting thing. There's, there's, everybody's heard of a placebo effect, right? And we all go, yeah, 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 that's, ooh, you know. We all want to run from the placebo effect. I say embrace it because it's one of the strongest things known to humankind, right? It is so potent that if you're trying to put a new pharmaceutical out there, you have to show that what you've got is better than placebo. And it's not just one thing. Placebo, it, it should be effects with an S. But I want, I want to tell you about this, this, this one type of placebo effect. So we know that if you give, give somebody uh, something like morphine, right, a very powerful opioid, that that helps them with their pain. Well, the other thing that they found is that if you tell somebody that I'm giving you something for your pain and you give them the opioid, that it has more of a pain relieving effect than if you tell them, if you don't tell them anything at all, measurably more potent, okay, by telling them I'm giving you something for your pain than just going, right? Mm -hmm. That's pretty amazing, right? That your brain, because you believe you're getting something to help you with your pain, actually says, okay, well, let's make the pain go away, mm -hmm. right? So when we do that with exercise, if you can actually build the confidence in the relationship that you have with your client, and you can actually say to them, hey, look, I've designed this thing for you, and I believe it is going to help you with your pain. I'm not saying that every time it will, but if you've built the relationship and they've had that experience with you, that you're thoughtful, you're caring, and you're not just reading something off the internet, right? <laughs> Copying it down and giving it to them. Then that might actually be something that becomes helpful, helpful to them, right? It may not change a darn thing about their internal structure, mm but it changes something in the way that their brain processes the feedback from their body. And that is a real thing. Call it placebo if you want, but placebo doesn't mean nothing. Placebo just means it's something within you that's doing it. I'm gonna say that again. Placebo doesn't mean nothing. It means that it's something in your body that is doing it. That is, uh, that is crazy. Hey, sweetie. Daddy, I want Excuse another us. snack. You want another snack? I'll tell you what. <laughs> I will get you another snack when I get done with this, okay? All right, I'll be done in about <laughs> 20 minutes, okay? Well, I, well, I can't <laughs> wait that long. Yes, you can wait that long. <laughs> you, want, you want to say hello to Eric? Say hello Hi. to Hi, everybody Ruby. else. Yeah. All right, little one, seriously. I'll, I, I will get you another snack um, in about 20 minutes, okay? You can wait. Well, I will like <laughs> an apple. An apple? We can go in the refrigerator and see if you can find one, okay? Okay. All right. Excuse me, folks. I'm I'm single dadding right now. So uh, you know. <laughs> she's so cute, man. <laughs> Thanks, man. Thanks. Wow, All right. So, so big. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's three and a half. She'll be four in uh, yeah, in May. Wow, That's yeah. crazy. Anyway, where were we? Um, um, I lost track myself too. But I have another question for you. Okay. <laughs> so, if someone's struggling with a chronic pain that might for, for the most part, we can figure out it's muscular in origin. Let's just say we know that. Do you have like maybe three things that people can do that on their own that might help them get out of that situation, maybe start to feel better, move better, maybe get rid of that discomfort? Um, it really depends on, the, on the, what I'll call the issues with the tissues. Excuse me, sweetheart. I really have to finish this meeting. Okay. <laughs> um, it really depends on um, what's going on with the tissues because if you have uh, something, for example, that is a, a nerve that's not moving very well, right? The solution for that individual is going to be different than if you have um, connective tissues in the ankle, excuse me, that are not moving very well, which would be different than if you have connective tissues in the shoulder that are not moving well. Right, because each one of these different tissues have different uh, densities of uh, nociception. In, in terms of, uh, in, in other words, they have different um, amounts of 
fibers within the tissue that are feeding back about giving you information about pain. And all of those tissues have different mechanical characteristics. So what I would need to do to create some relief might be different. Mm -hmm. right? So my first exploration is to try to get a better understanding of what are the physical challenges? Uh, is, is something being compressed too much? Is something being, um, is, is there too much tensile uh, force on something? Um, or is there a, um, a metabolic issue? Is the tissue that is being challenged um, metabolically, uh, I'll call it immature. It just can't keep up. Right. So each so one some, of these circumstances would require a different type of intervention. Yeah. Yeah. They really would. They really would. Um, I will say this, I, I, I will say this. Um, one of the things that, that I'm, I'm learning to do with my clients more consistently is learn to listen to yourself well enough that you know when uh, when something when when an exercise is go either going to help you or if it's kind of not going to help you okay mm -hmm. what I mean by that is when I first meet people especially people who are suffering with chronic uh, pain their belief is that more pain is required in order to feel better. Right? So they will tolerate people doing things that feel worse and they know it because they're thinking something's got to give, maybe it has to get worse to get better. Mm -hmm. Right? So the first thing I want to do is I want to get, get people to say, Hey, no, that's really, no, that is not feeling better. I should stop. Right? as opposed to let's keep going and to be able to describe what is that experience that you're having as, as that, as that pain is coming on, is it a tingling pain? Is it a burning pain? Is it a pain that radiates? Is it a pain that feels very sharp and focused? Is it a pain that consistently comes at the same part of the range of motion or does it kind of slide around a little bit? Does it reach out in the kind of like grabby kind of a pain? Right? There are all, all these different things that you want to know about this, this type of pain. And then we might have some hints about what is, um, what is triggering the pain. Got it. So it sounds like maybe um, a piece of advice from what you just said is if someone wants to resolve an issue and they want to be proactive about fixing it, uh, pay attention to the sensations you're having. And if it doesn't feel right to you, maybe try something different or adjust what you're doing to make it feel better. Absolutely. So Absolutely. Yes. And, and, and um, as you are looking for people to help you, if you find that they're not listening to you as you're describing the nature of your experience, walk out the door, right? Because that data that you're giving them is critical to help it should be critical to helping that helping them figure out what's going on. Mm. But if they don't want to listen, then that means that they're going to just try to put you in a box. Oh, uh, you got sciatica. It's like, no, hold on, hold on. Wait, wait, wait. <clears throat> right. Yeah. Yeah. I, that, that's a common issue that I hear with people come to see me is they've gone through the funnel of many other practitioners and it is always relatively protocol based. Um, so that's a good piece of advice for sure. Yeah. And they're not listening. You know, a lot of people just don't listen, you know? So, yeah, yeah, I, that is a, that is a problem, not just in the fitness industry, but definitely within the fitness industry for sure. Uh, you know, I wanted to just touch base really real quickly on some of the unique things that you do with your clients, but also you mm -hmm. do within our, um, within this, the educational uh, program that you offer other professionals like myself. Um, and that is like the, the real-time data that you collect with some of these devices mm. that are starting to grow within the fitness, fitness industry. And some people might even be exposed to some of this stuff. So I thought it'd be interesting just to give a brief overview of some of the things that you do with your clients that are a little bit um, data-driven, more from an objective sure. standpoint, what that sure. looks like. Yeah. Um, well, one of the things that, um, that I use is um, – uh, I look at uh, oxygen saturation. So I use these things called MOXIE sensors. Uh, it's 
the technical term is near infrared spectroscopy. And these little sensors sit right over the muscle that you're interested in. And what they uh, detect is the amount of oxygen in that muscle and also give you a, a, a way of um, observing the flow of blood into that muscle as well. And that's a really, really cool thing, um, especially if you're, as you're looking from things to the left to right, um, trying to understand the difference between um, a, um, an athlete like a football player or an athlete like a soccer player or an athlete like a um, marathoner or, or someone who just wants to you know, lose 25 pounds, right? But this kind of data can really help you figure out um, how hard someone should be working on any given day. And if they're working hard enough, or if their if their response, if their body's response to hard work, is the response that you're looking for, mm-hmm. right? So that becomes the other thing is that you know, say you have somebody who is, they're killing themselves, but the response of their bot to their by their 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 neuromuscular system is not the one that you want. You won't know that because at the end of the workout they're dead. I mean, not dead, but you know. You, they're crushed. They, they put it all on the table, but it's not, and you have no idea of understanding what's happening on the inside um, unless you have something like these SMO2 sensors. Um, the other one that um, I use a lot is um, uh, surface electromyography. And these sensors sit on top of the muscles and they give us information about the activity of the nervous system. And some of the sensors that I have look at the, um, the muscle fibers that are um, under the sensor and others actually will break it down to the individual motor units of the muscle that's under the sensor, which is pretty cool too. Uh, so we can do things like um, if we have an athlete uh, who comes in and like, hey, I'm a soccer player, I feel great. We take these measurements of the way their quadriceps and their hamstrings, you know, fire uh, when they're running and when they're doing squats. And then if they should get hurt and they have an injury and they want to know if they're ready to play again, we can say, okay, come on in. Your physical therapist says you're ready to play. Come on. Your strength coach says you're ready to play. Come on in. Let's evaluate how those muscles are firing right now, right? Compared to before. And we'll oftentimes we'll see that, yeah, when they do their exercise, it's symmetrical in terms of strength, but there's one or two muscles that are dominant, right? Mm. And there's somebody who's, you know, as a result of the injury, is just out to lunch. So if we send that athlete back out there, eventually they're going to tear something up, right? Mm. So this is a way that we can, you know, it's a, a way of, of helping athletes be smarter about their recovery um, and even helping non-athletes um, be a little bit more confident about their recovery as well. Um, yeah, this sounds like uh, I know that most of these things tend to be centered within the athletic community or for, for pro athletes because there's so much money behind that. But it almost seems like this would be more of a service for those who like the common folk that might have uh, issues developed over their life that they can't seem to get out of without objective information, uh, this could really open the doors to the, figuring out the resolution and maybe taking out some of the guesswork. Yeah, it's huge. I, I, I'll say that the, the surface, surface electromyography is pretty darn pricey and it does take um, uh, a good chunk of time to do it well. The um, SMO2, the near infrared spectroscopy is actually relatively affordable. And it's really easy to use, pretty hard to mess up, um, but you do need to be educated in order to um, have, uh, I think, some good insight in terms of, of interpreting the data. I mean, you could you could make a mess of it if you mm. just try to kind of you know make stuff up. But in terms of the the use of the sensors, they're really easy. It's fast. It's in real time, so you can be showing your clients while it's happening. Um, it's really really cool. Um, what kind uh, of value do you find your clients get when you do this with them? Like your, your normal folk, oh. like when you're using these MOX sensors, they see it there and then they start to associate sensations with these actual real things. Like, does that help them navigate their training a little bit? It's, it's huge. Cause they totally get why, like on the first day, I'm not like crushing them. I'm like, look, look, look at what's happening on the inside. 
this is what we want and this is what's happening. If we push, continue to push you right here, we're, we're getting no closer to our goal. Mm-hmm. And all we're doing is tearing this, tearing this other stuff up, increasing the likelihood of all this other stuff we don't want. Mm-hmm. They're like, oof, great, awesome. <laughs> and then they see, as they see themselves progress, they're like, this is really cool. I've never hit that part of a workout where I'd feel incompetent, incapable, and like this sucks. Hmm. I'm working hard, but I, but, and I'm working harder than I ever have. And sometimes we get to failure, but I'm always surprised. It's yeah. It's of- less than they need. They think they need in a lot of cases. Yeah. That's uh that's pretty nuts. <laughs> it, is. it is. I'm going to, I'm definitely going to be getting one of these uh, sensors soon. I'm actually uh, soon to be getting a bunch of uh, force reading devices from Convent. Oh, yeah. Have you heard yeah, of them? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I'm excited about that. And then adding this, man, it's going to be fun. It's uh, yeah. everyone, everyone needs to go out to Maine to, to try these out with Jock. <laughs> uh, come on up. I, I will probably be running a, like a live session. Um, I'm going to guess probably next fall would be, be my guess. Uh, maybe this spring, but probably next fall, uh, we'll, we'll break out all this um, all this cool equipment. Yeah, I've got a, a really cool force dynamometer that allows us to uh, like look at the difference in force of a concentric and an eccentric. It'll blow your mind. I promise you. I promise you. It just blows your mind to actually see that this idea that you're stronger on an eccentric than a concentric is kind of like a, oh, duh, <laughs> you know. And for people that don't know, the concentrics lifting the weight and then eccentric lowering. I know there's a lot of jargon that we threw out in this uh, discussion. Oh, I, I apologize for that. <laughs> but uh, we, we both get a little geeky and nerdy about these things. Uh, and, and, and if you if you want to want need the definition for any of those things, feel free to reach out to Eric. And if Eric doesn't know it, feel free to reach out to me. Um, really, truly, I'm happy to, 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 to share it with you. I yeah, I forget about that sometimes. You know? Yeah, I appreciate the the offer for for tutoring. You know, um, I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but do you also do virtual consult consulting with people? I do. Okay. I do. Yeah. Um, at the end, I'll, I'll, let, I'll re-ask you about where people can find you. But I was kind of interested to just kind of take a little break from what we were doing, maybe get some personal questions in. It'd be kind of sure. fun. Yeah. Um, okay. So. If you do you have a quote that you live by? Mm. No, not 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 a quote as much as um I don't know if it's a quote. I'm sure maybe it is a quote, but it's just just this idea of be curious. You know, mm. just be curious. That's quote by Jock Newell Taylor. <laughs> 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 maybe, I don't know. <laughs> what what is the uh What's the theme song to your life? Uh, it doesn't have words, though, unfortunately. Oh, is it like a yeah. jazz song? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a song called Moments Notice. <laughs> is that like your, you play that on sax? Uh, yeah, I, you could play it on sax. I, I, yeah, I did. I used to play it on sax. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a song by uh, me. It was known uh, as a song by John Coltrane. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I know that. Um, if you had to, if you went back to speak to yourself 10 years ago, which what kind of advice would you give yourself? <laughs> 10 years ago, <laughs> um, 10 years ago. Ooh, wow. Oh, wow. Um, I would have said, um, work on buying a building. <laughs> no joke. Yeah. Buy a building. It's a it's a good investment for sure. What? Dude, that's that's it. You know, sets you up. Yeah, <clears throat> I'll be uh, taking that advice now. Do it. <laughs> All right, a couple more. If you could go back in time and meet one person, dead or alive, who would you meet? Mm. Hmm. I think it would have to be, uh, yeah, I think it would be Benjamin Banneker. <laughs> I don't even know who that is. Who is that? Yeah, he, he was uh, like uh, an inventor, astronomer. And I think astronomers are really cool because I'm like, how can you, 
I, I want to know how you assure yourself that your interpretation of the way things are moving is right. Like, I, I, it's, I mean, they got it right, but that's like, how did you do that? Yeah. Um, yeah, this dude was pretty amazing. He invented a whole lot of stuff and was just super smart. And so I just wonder, like, guys like that, how do you, yeah, how, how do you have that kind of imagination and then it lines up with physics so well? <laughs> it's, that? Yeah, it's remarkable. Yeah. I, I've been listening to Neil deGrasse Tyson. You know who he is? Oh, yeah, absolutely, man. Yeah, yeah. He's- He's a he's a funny guy. He's a really smart but really so good smart. teacher. Yeah, a fantastic teacher. He makes everything so easy to understand. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right, last one. Where what's something that you're really fascinated with right now? Doesn't have to be exercise, but it can be. <clears throat> oh, uh, something I'm really fascinated with right now. Let me think about this. Um, oh yeah, well, yeah. So I'm really fascinated with this um, this idea of. Um, yeah, energy substrates and like really what what's the stuff inside of a cell that differentiates the person who can uh, run a marathon, like win a marathon versus um, win an 800 meter versus um, play football. Like what the heck are the differences in those tissues that allow those people to do those things. And, and none of them, nobody can, none of them can switch back and forth, right. At the highest levels. So mm-hmm. I, I'm just trying to wrap my brain around like really the differences. And, and I know people want to go, Oh no, it's aer- aerobic anaerobic. That's not true. Mm-hmm. That's just not true. It's, it's, it's a lot more, it's more um, sophisticated than that. Yeah. You pointed that out in your in our classes, easily seeing the this constant crossover between aerobic and anaerobic yeah. metabolism is really uh, was really eye opening because it's not yeah. how it's described in the literature at all. So that's uh, yeah. that is very confusing, but to I'm sure will be uh, a piece of the puzzle that gets expanded on in the next decade and more. Yeah, for um, sure, enlightening for sure. Well, for sure. hey, Jock, I really appreciate you taking this time. I know it's tough when you're watching your daughter and all that <laughs> appreciated yeah. her, uh, her her hello too i haven't seen her so that was awesome you know if, cool. if people want to consult with you or maybe get some advice or tips or maybe a client or even personal trader or anything like that where, where can they find more information to connect with you they can go to exercise design lab.com that's the that's where you can you know see a bunch of information um, or just email me jacques at exercise design lab.com and um, one of these days, I'm going to say the next uh, two weeks, I'm going to step back into the Instagram, TikTok arena um, after a long hiatus. So I'll be there, too. All right. Awesome. I'm excited to see see what you put out, man. All right. <laughs> Thank All right, you, Eric. I, I really appreciate uh, you reaching out. And, um, like, you have really um, – I oh, mean, you've really done it. I really, I really appreciate the the, the work that you do, and um, it's just been a pleasure of studying with you over the years. I appreciate the kind words, man, and many years to come. You bet. All right, man. You have a great uh, rest of your weekend. Enjoy your time with your with your daughter, and uh, I'll be in touch soon. Sounds good. All right. Take care, man.